What's going on everyone? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Nick. So you spent weeks scouring the internet for the perfect 3D printer. It finally arrives, you unbox it, you open up Bamboo Studio, and bam, settings wall hits you like a ton of bricks. Trust me, I have been there. So today we're gonna keep it nice and simple. I'm gonna walk you through the small handful of settings that matter the most, why they work, when to use them, and by the end of this video, you'll know exactly how to get cleaner, more consistent prints every single time. Now I'm going to assume that you've spent at least a small amount of time and printed a few different models with your printer. So I won't go into too much detail of what a slicer is or how your printer works. If you wanna know more in-depth details, you can watch my complete beginner's tutorial on Bamboo Studio. That tutorial goes through everything with much greater detail. This video is going to be your quick start guide that goes over the most important settings only. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have our advanced mode turned on. If this is your first time, trust me, it's going to seem very overwhelming. I totally agree, but once you get through this tutorial, you'll feel much more comfortable with it. Great, now we have way more features to fine tune our quality, strength, speed, and many other features that I use daily to achieve higher quality and a very, very low amount of failures. I definitely have to admit, many of my print failures come from rushing through my print settings, and sometimes I completely miss something. Now what I would like to do is make sure that we have our printer set up correctly. Since this video is covering Bamboo Studio 2.3, I will assume you're using Bamboo Lab printers. As you can see, I have mine set up here in the left-hand menu. If you don't have your printer set up, then you can use the Select and Remove option. It will give you a list of all the Bamboo Lab printers and a small selection of other manufacturers as well. Simply select the printer type and hit Confirm. You will then see the printer added to your menu. Now I hope that you're using the default textured PEI plate I highly recommend you use this until you get more experience under your belt. I see way too many people using these plates that they bought off of Amazon and are seeing failures. So do yourself a favor, stick to the PEI plate for now. Next, if you hit the sync info button right here on the right, what it's going to do is try and gather the printer nozzle and AMS information directly from your printer. Now, assuming you have not swapped out your nozzle on your printer and you should have a diameter set at 0.4 millimeters. This also makes sure that you have your flow set to standard, which should be default. All right, next, let's quickly go over the most important tools here in the toolbar. Just like the slicer settings over here on the sidebar, you will only use a handful of them most of the time. The first icon is the add button. It allows you to load in or import a 3D model. I tend to use this button or just drag and drop my model onto the workspace, which works perfectly fine. Next to this is the build plate button. This will allow you to add more build plates to your project. Great for organizing your projects when you have multiple models, or even I like to import a lot of the same type of models into one project file, such as all my A1 must prints or a bunch of succulent pots, and you can use that file as a collection. It's just a great way of being able to organize and store multiple models together in a single project. Now there's quite a bit more that you can do like changing slicer settings on each plate, but that's a feature that I already went over in my 22 Bamboo Studio Tips video that I highly recommend you watch. The next button is the auto orient button. It will rearrange your model best way it sees fit for printing. Now while it does a great job most of the time, you still need to be aware that it does not always make the best decision, so just keep that in mind. The Arrange All Objects is a feature that I rarely use. It just takes all your models on your build plate and arranges them for you. The next button is the Variable Layer Height feature. This is an advanced feature that will give you smoother prints. I've gone into great detail about this feature in a separate video, so I highly recommend you watch that video right after this one. It goes into full detail about how it works. Next is the Move, Rotate, and Scale tools. I think they are quite obvious on what they can do. The Move feature allows you to move your models on the build plate. The Rotate feature will allow you to rotate your models, and the Scale feature will allow you to scale the size of your models. Again, if you need help with this, I go into much more detail in my complete Bamboo Studio tutorial. Next, the Lay on Face tool is something that I pretty much use every day. What this tool does is allow you to select a face on your model that you would like to lay flat onto the build plate. So for example, let me take this model right here. I'm going to rotate it real quick, and let's pretend that this is how I imported it right into Bamboo Studio. Well, it's obvious that we don't want to print it like this. So if I switch to the Lay on Face tool, you'll see that all these white shapes appear. These are the different faces of the model. If I rotate my view to the bottom and click on this white circle here, you will see that the model quickly lays on that face. You will find that many models will not always be correctly oriented for printing, and you have to make adjustments. You can either rely on the auto orient tool or manually do it with the lay on face tool. The next tool in the toolbar that I use quite regularly is the brim ears tool. 
It is a newer feature, so let's quickly take a look. Basically what it does is lay a little disc around your model onto the build plate to prevent it from warping or peeling up. To be honest, all I do here is adjust my head diameter to 15 for larger models and 8 for small to medium models. Then I hit the auto generate points button. You will see the circle disc appear around your model. Now all you need to do is change your brim type to painted, but we'll do that later in this video. Now that we have an understanding of my most important toolbar features and what they do exactly, let's go ahead and move on to the slicer settings. With the advanced mode turned on, Bamboo Studio may feel overwhelming. Trust me when I say, we'll get through this together. You'll end up ignoring 90% of these settings anyways. Now with that said, settings can sometimes get lost in all of this. So I recommend you learn about the search feature. If you're looking for a specific setting, you can just start typing it right here in the search bar and Bamboo Studio will take you right to it. Now I wasn't lying to you when I literally said there was around six settings that you need to worry about. Since we are using the standard 0.4 millimeter nozzle, this is what you'll be using for 99% of your prints. Unless you're into printing small miniatures or statues where you wanna get more detail from your printer, then you may wanna look into a 0.2 millimeter nozzle. But honestly, 3D printing technology has advanced so rapidly over the past few years, you'll be happy with the results that you get from the default 0.4 millimeter nozzle. If you would like to see how well an A1 printer can perform at a smaller layer height using the default 0.4 millimeter nozzle, then I would highly recommend you check out my FDM versus resin video, and I'll drop a link down below. The first feature that I'd like you to be aware of are the templates. Those are located right here in this dropdown. Bamboo Studio has made it as easy as changing to one of these templates to get a higher quality print. Just be aware that this will also increase your print times. Now let's pretend for a minute that you really want to get the highest quality print out of this model. You can do that by selecting one of the pre-made templates. Let's go with this 0.12 millimeter high quality template. Now when you make your selection, it's going to automatically adjust the settings down here in all the settings tabs to fit that template. This is a great way to change your print quality without having to worry about adjusting multiple settings below. Let's go ahead and undo this and go back to the 0.2 millimeter standard. What I would like to do is touch on just a few of the individual settings in the tabs below. These are the ones that are going to have the highest impact on the quality and consistency of your prints. Down towards the bottom of the quality tab, there is one setting that you should adjust if you notice quality issues with your print walls. By print walls, I mean the outside edges of your print. By default, most slicers print the inner walls first, then the outer walls last. But flipping that to print the outer wall first can give you noticeable better surface quality. And here's why. When the outer wall is printed first, it lays down a clean, uninterrupted line with no pressure from the surrounding walls. That means less vibration, less dragging, no bulging from the filament squeezing against the already printed perimeters. You get smoother lines and cleaner curves, especially noticeable on rounded or detailed parts. Now before we move forward, I wanted to mention one thing. Since we made changes to our default settings, they will change color to orange. This is telling us that in the quality tab that a setting has been changed from the default template. You can quickly revert back to the default by hitting this orange circle icon right here. Let's go ahead and move over to the strength tab next. This is going to be the most important settings in my opinion. Now there are three different settings that you need to pay attention to here. The wall loops, sparse infill density, and infill pattern. Three slicer settings that make a huge impact on your print strength, weight, and quality. Let me explain to you each of these settings. Wall loops are the outer shells that form the perimeter of your print. These are the vertical walls that wrap around the part and the more you have, the stronger and more solid your print becomes. Most prints do great with two or three wall loops, but if you're making a part that needs to hold pressure or take impact or seal against leaks, bumping that up can make a big difference. Over the last year, I've used a higher number of wall loops and a lower infill density. The amount of rigidity that you get going from two walls to six walls is quite amazing. You can totally feel a huge difference just by holding the same part that was printed with two wall loops over six. Now this is where you need to make a decision on what you're printing. I print a lot of larger models with multiple parts that get glued together. Having the higher amount of wall loops makes for a much more rigid end result. Or if you happen to be printing something like a helmet and will be sanding off multiple layers of material in post-processing, then having those extra wall loops will come in handy with avoiding holes and having a stronger helmet. For smaller models like articulating dragons or statues that will just sit on a shelf then the default two walls should be sufficient enough. Use my suggestions and make an educated decision when printing your models. Next up is sparse infill density. This controls how much material gets printed inside your model. Lower densities like 10 or 15% are perfect for light decorative prints. 
But if you need strength or rigidity, moving up to 20 or 25% gives you a much more tougher part without going completely solid. Here's the rule of thumb I go by for density, because there are a few different factors to consider when making your choice. Now with that said, there really is no wrong choice for this, but you can save on both print time and weight by making an educated decision. When printing a model such as this Minecraft toy, I may pick four or five walls, because if my daughter happens to drop it on the hard floor and it's only printed with two walls, it could very well break. So I decided to go with four walls. Now I really don't want the toy to be super heavy. Printing this with 20% infill would be completely out of the question. It will increase the weight of it by way too much. So I decided on something much less, like 10% or even 8%. Since it has four walls, I know it will be pretty rigid. And if I can lighten it up with less infill, then I think we have a good match. The higher the infill, it will obviously increase the weight. So if you need a heavier print, you can always increase the infill. Take these examples and learn to make an educated decision when deciding on your walls and infill density. Finally, there's sparse infill pattern, which is the pattern used to fill the inside. Each one has different benefits. Triangles are fast to print and strong. Gyroid gives you strength in every direction with a cool curved look. These are my two go-to patterns, with one caveat. I never use triangle infill on taller parts or on bed slinger printers like the A1. I have noticed more failures using triangles with these two scenarios. The reason being is when the triangle pattern gets printed, it passes over the edge of the walls and the supports. I have witnessed a failure happen and I've seen it happen in my time lapses. Just a slight change in height and it will rip off the support and bang into the side of the model. If I had to guess on the number of failures with triangles, it would probably be in the range of 3-5%. to Now if we're talking about a Core XY printer, such as the P1s or the H2s, I typically never see a failure caused from a triangle infill pattern. If you would rather not deal with failures caused by your infill pattern, then just go with your gyroid all day and you should be fine. But why would I even want to run triangles in the first place? Well, triangles for one are strong, and they are also much faster than gyroid. When I'm printing 150 different models for a large skull, I can knock off an entire week of print time with the triangle pattern alone. It's a gamble, but again, I have my rules for when I use it and when to switch to gyroid, and it's made a big difference in my workflow. Adjusting the settings in the speed tab is an advanced topic, but I wanted to mention one setting and give you something to think about. Now it's quite obvious that one of the most important features for 3D printers, besides quality, is going to be its speed. So getting the most out of the speed settings is going to be a plus. However, with these fast speeds, issues compromising quality can happen. So keep in mind if you ever run into a quality issue, you may want to reduce your printer speed. Start with the outer wall speed first. Next up is our support tab and there are a few different settings that we want to keep in mind when slicing your model. Let's go ahead and enable supports. Now there are two types of supports, tree and normal or grid. Supports are one of those settings that will take some time to understand how they work to make a better decision for your print. Now I say better because let's say you print this model with tree supports. While tree supports are probably a better decision, printing it with normal supports is also okay. You will probably get the same results either way. This Spartan helmet will definitely need supports for printing. Let's see what that looks like for both tree supports and normal supports. First, I'm going to slice the helmet with normal supports. I'm sure you can agree that this looks quite ridiculous, but let's check how much filament is actually being used for the supports. Up here in the overview menu, let's change it to line type. If we scroll and look under the support line item, you can see that's going to take over one day to print all the supports for this helmet. And it's also going to take up 51% of the print time. That is just insane. Oh, and it's also going to take 1300 grams of filament. Now let's switch over to tree supports with a default style and try again. And as you can see, we have quite a big difference. The tree supports are only going to take up 13 hours of print time with only 30% of the total and less than 450 grams of filament. So we definitely have a winner in this scenario. What I always suggest doing is test both out and usually the winner will present itself. Normal supports can be handy when you're trying to support a large flat overhanging area. They will print faster than tree supports will in this scenario. The next setting in the support tab that I always have on is a support critical region only. This will remove smaller overhangs automatically. Let's go ahead and enable that and re-slice. I have a feeling this area up here is going to be removed. And now we have reduced our support print time even further. Five and a half hours down from over a day with the grid supports. The next setting is very critical to remember and I adjust this for every print. It is the initial layer expansion setting. 
This is going to be the size of brim around your supports. Now for a helmet like this, I would recommend using 10 or more. There's nothing that hurts my heart more than seeing a support break loose right towards the end of a print. I would rather lay down some extra filament to ensure a solid base for my supports than walk into a failed support that is ultimately going to give you a failed print. Let's reslice our model now and see how that works. Now you can see we have a much larger surface area on our build plate. This is going to prevent them from coming loose. It will be up to you to make an educated guess as to how much. The taller the print, the more I use. If it's a critical print, I'd even use 20 for my expansion just to make 100% sure it won't come loose. But as I mentioned, this is going to be something that you'll need to decide on. Just remember to use this feature for larger prints. Now the next set of settings is going to make for a much cleaner support removal. I go over these in my 22 Bamboo Studio Tips video, but let's go ahead and include them here. The first setting and the most important to improve your support removal is going to be the top Z distance. Bamboo Studio defaults at 0.2 millimeters, so adjusting this to 0.23 to 0.25 will give you better results. What this is going to give you is just a tiny bit of extra space between your model and your supports, making for an easier removal process. Now when your printer is creating supports near your model, it transitions to what is called interface layers. The default is set to two, but I always like to give my printer a little bit of extra material for this area, so I change mine to three layers. Different materials may give you different results. It's just been a setting that I stick with in my must change settings. Now, if you happen to have an AMS, we can take this one step further. If you don't mind a little bit more print time, you can change your support interface material. Since PLA and PETG don't stick to each other, you can change your interface support material to PLA if you happen to be printing your model in PETG. This will allow for a much easier removal from your model. Once you make this change in Bamboo Studio, you'll get a pop-up with suggested changes to your settings. I always choose yes and allow Bamboo Studio to make the adjustment. And these are going to be your most important settings for your support tab. Now let's go ahead and move on to the others tab. The only setting that we're going to adjust here is the brim type. Since we enabled brim ears at the beginning of this video, we need to change our brim type from auto to painted. This will enable the brim ears to be generated in the slicer. Now the last thing that I'd like to mention is since we're making all these adjustments to our settings, why not keep them for later? To do this, hit the little disc icon right here. Now what it wants us to do is give it a name. You can give it whatever you want, but what I like to do is use words that remind me of all the changes that I made. Or even if I'm printing a large project such as a Triceratops model, you can add something like Triceratops, 6W for walls, 12IF for infill, etc. Once you have a name, hit OK and it will be saved to your user presets. Now that we have our settings in place, the last thing I'd like to do is show you how to slice your model and send it to the printer. Up here in the top right is the slice plate button. Clicking that will tell Bamboo Studio to apply all of your slicer settings we just went over. Now slicing is exactly what it sounds like. Bamboo Studio is slicing your model in many layers and creating all the paths that your printer will need to make to completely print your model. You can quickly get a summary of your print by switching to line type right here. It will give you the total print time and filament. If you're happy with everything, just hit the print plate button right here. Make sure you have the correct printer selected. Next, hit the send button and Bamboo Studio will upload the slice model to your printer and begin the print process. All right, that is my complete beginner's guide. I covered all the most important features that I use every single day. Remember, there is so much more for you to learn with Bamboo Studio that will allow you to get way more out of your printer. And for a complete walkthrough, I recommend checking out my complete tutorial where I walk you through everything Bamboo Studio. If you feel that I skipped an important setting to you, that you use often, let me know in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this content. If so, I think you know what to do. Again, my name is Nick. I hope you're having a great day and as always, happy printing.